Okay. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Martha Craig. I'm the executive director of Friends of Herring River, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all today. And um, I think we're really happy to have two great speakers come and talk about their experience with tidal restoration projects um, here on the Cape. Some of which you may be familiar with, but others um, you might not be. So we look forward to those presentations. So first I'd like to thank our speakers, Dr. Bob Duncanson from the Town of Chatham, who's in the back, and Abel Wopes from Association to Preserve Cape Cod. And thank you for coming all the way to Wellfleet to talk about your experiences with uh, tidal restoration projects. And I don't see any elected officials in the office because like they're in the room. I'd like to acknowledge them. But um, we do have a number of board members, if you could raise your hands, who are here, um, many of whom you know. And of course, they're always eager to um, talk to you about your questions. And we also have members of the uh, Harry River Stakeholders Group. Bill Wilkinda over here is the, the chair. And I see Mo Barocas there. Thanks for coming. And if I'm missing anybody else, I apologize. Uh, or raise your hand. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge Steve Spear from the Hearing River Restoration Committee, which is a, a multi-agency committee with federal, state, regional, and local expertise on that. So we'll hear more about the Restoration Committee and our project partners um, a little bit more. Um, so, there. Um, so what I'd like to do is just take a, a few minutes before presenters um, come up to talk to you a little bit about the Herring River Restoration Project and sort of familiarize with a brief summary and where we are today on that. And then um, I'll introduce Bob to give his presentation and follow up by April. And then after April's presentation, we'll have a question and answer session. So I would ask you to just um, hold off any questions you might have until then. And um, just a few um, housekeeping things. We have a sign-in sheet. Um, we like to know who's here, and it's a good way for us to get your contact information. So if you could take a minute to sign in, um, maybe later on, if you haven't already, that would be terrific. And we also have a sheet to um, for you to put um, down any topics that you might be interested in um, hearing a future meeting on. I would be interested to hear what your thoughts are on that uh, for a future meeting. And just one last thing I'll mention is that um, this presentation is being recorded today by Tom Cole, so thank you, Tom. And the presentation will then be uploaded to the Friends of Herring River website um, for you and all your friends um, to watch at a later time. And the and town then, website. And the town website, terrific. That's great. Um, so before I start um, with a brief summary of the Herring River Restoration Project, I'd just like to mention and emphasize that there have been tidal restoration projects all throughout Cape Cod and throughout Massachusetts. And although each project has its um, unique circumstances and perhaps potential challenges, there are many underlying similarities between all the different tidal <coughs> restoration projects, including things such as poor water quality within the estuary, perhaps aging infrastructure like we have here in the Herring River. Uh, but there's, they're also done um, with good science, solid science behind it, proven hydrologic modeling and engineering. And um, also importantly, as I alluded to earlier, support from multiple partners who have really good hands-on experience with tidal restoration. And in fact, many of the agencies that are working currently on the Herring River Restoration Project have also worked on multiple tidal projects, restoration projects here on the Cape, and, and you'll see that in some of the presentations. So think about the similarities, um, but also maybe some of the differences um, in this project. And, and so I would mention, while well, the Harry River Project is innovative in its design and its approach, the concepts behind the restoration and the design um, have been established for a long time and have been around for a long time, and, and nothing really um, new there. And, and then the, the big difference I'd also like to mention and uh, to point out is with the Harry River Restoration Project, 
It'll be implemented with controlled implement, uh, incremental opening of the tight gates. So that's a little bit different than um, some of, some of the uh, presentations you might see. So just briefly, um, the goal of the Herring River Restoration Project is to restore over a thousand acres of the Herring River Estuary, which was once one of the most productive salt marsh systems in the Northeast. Um, phase one, which we are currently going into the permitting phase for, will restore approximately 570 acres of the former estuary, 95% of which is owned um, by the National Cape Cod National Seashore. The, the tidal restoration will occur by removing the existing tide restrictions that occur, the, the major one being at the Chequesset Neck Dyke, and to restore the natural tidal flow, as I said, incrementally or gradually over time. The rationale behind the project is to prevent ongoing degradation of the estuary, to reclaim ecological and environmental benefits of a healthy estuary, and also to replace the existing 40-year-old dike with a more resilient infrastructure. So the, the project partners include the Town of Wellfleet and the Cape Cod National Seashore, who are the proponents of the project. And then also working heavily on the project um, is the U.S. Department of Agriculture, who Steve Spear here represents through the National Natural Resources Conservation Service. We also have the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration on the federal side also working with the Massachusetts Division of Ecological Restoration and Friends of Herring River. So the major elements of the project include uh, replacing the current structure down here at Chequesset Neck Road with a new bridge and tide control gates. There will also be a new dike here at uh, Mill Creek. This is um, Chequesset yeah, Country Club, just to orient you. There'll be a new dike here with a tie gate that will be able to control water going into the Mill Creek subbasin. And there'll also be um, a tie gate and a uh, dike in the form of a raised road here at Whole Dike Road uh, to prevent or control water from going in upper Whole Dike subbasin, which is not part of phase one. So there'll be no restoration in that area until hopefully a later date. And then also there's a portion of High House Road here that goes across the floodplain that acts as a major tide restriction. That will be removed. So most of you are familiar with the Chequesset Neck Road Dyke. That's the major culprit to the uh, tide restriction. It was constructed originally in 1909 and then um, failed about 60 years later and, and rebuilt in 1973. <coughs> so you can see originally the opening to the Herring River was about 165 feet. Currently, and in comparison, it's now 18 feet, which is a um, you know, pr pretty large uh, difference. And, and actually, there are the three culverts here on the current dike. Only one of these culverts allows water <coughs> to flow into the river. Um, so there's really, instead of 18 feet wide, there's really only six feet opening for water going in. Uh, and then water can flow out. There are tie gates. Um, on the opposite side that you can't see that uh, are in poor condition and in some condition, uh, some instances, instances um, rusted shut or open. Um, so, so the goal is to restore tidal flow incrementally uh, by replacing the current structure oops, sorry, uh, with this 165 foot wide bridge span with adjustable tie gates and 16 panels which can be removed so at the end of full restoration, um, this could be fully opened. But in the meantime, these gates will be allowed to be uh, open incrementally over time. So the restoration area at the end of phase one would include this blue area here. Um, outlined in red is the full project. Um, but we're focusing now right on phase one, the blue area. And you can see um, the green area is the Cape Cod National Seashore. So 95% of the projects are in the seashore. Other work that will need to be done to prevent any uh, public and private structures uh, from any impacts, all the structures will be protected, uh, included elevating some areas of low roads and upgrading culverts, elevating portions of the country club, installing flood protection measures on the three additional 
private properties that uh, may have structures impacted and installing a tight and coral structure on the seashore property. So this gets to the rationale behind um, implementing the project. Currently, the CNR Dyke is designated as a point source of pollution by the Division of Marine Fisheries um, and has led to shellfish closures, not only upstream, upstream of the dike, but downstream as well, as many of you are well aware. Um, the Herring River is also classified by the EPA and the state as an impaired water under the uh, Clean Water Act. And there's been substantial marsh subsidence uh, and leaching of uh, acid sulfate from the soils, uh, which have resulted in fish kills. Uh, the Herring River habitat itself has degraded and the dike acts as a major impediment to uh, herring migration and the loss of salt marsh um, has uh, been replaced by invasive species. And you can just see here briefly, this in, in beige is the historic extent of the former, of the salt marsh, and in black is the current extent of the salt marsh today. So uh, it's quite a, a substantial difference. So with the implementation of the uh, restoration, uh, we expect to improve water quality, <coughs> Um, the salt marsh to recover over 570 acres in phase one. Um, the shellfish bed should be enhanced and hopefully some reopened. Um, the recovery of river here in habitat and uh, reclaimed habitat for other important marine species, um, importantly to striped bass, winter flounder, and diamondback terrapin. And also to reconnect the Herring River with the Gulf of Maine and bring it back to be that engine of productivity for both near shore and offshore um, fisheries that it once was. Um, it will also have an impact on carbon sequestration and greenhouse gas emissions um, and building more resilient infrastructure for sea level rise and coastal flooding. It will improve natural mosquito control, and as well as enhance recreation and tourism and increase economic spending and help support the blue economy here in Cape Cod. And this is just a list of the supporting organizations. I won't read them um, off now, but um, we have great support and a lot of expertise for this project. So just wanted to acknowledge um, those groups. So with that, um, Bob, I'd like um, to introduce Bob Duncanson from the town of Chatham. Take that, and I'll just pop this up. Good afternoon. Uh, can everybody hear me well? Yes. Okay, I've never been accused of being quiet, and I don't like <laughs> microphones. So if, if it becomes a problem, let me know, and I'll use it. But if not, I think the room's small enough that you should be able to hear me. Um, pretty well. So, uh, Martha gave a great introduction um, to what I'm going to talk about. In fact, she covered many of the same things that we dealt with dealing with the Muddy Creek uh, restoration project that really got started probably around 2000, maybe even a little bit earlier than that. Uh, it seems like it's been forever, and in some ways it has been. Um, we have many of the same partners. We partnered with the Division of Ecological Restoration at the state level and then with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at the federal level. And ours is a joint project between Chatham and Harwich <coughs> because the town line goes right down through the middle of Muddy Creek. <coughs> so half of it's in Chatham, half of it's in Harwich. So in order to do what we needed to do, we had to work together, uh, which was great. One of the first times, really, that towns really worked together really well and got a huge project accomplished in what was an amazing amount of time. Uh, so just to give you some history, uh, there used to be a bridge over Muddy Creek back in the 1800s. Um, and around the turn of the century, for whatever reason, they decided to get rid of that bridge, uh, which was right here, and replace it with a, an embankment. Uh, and we actually have, uh, it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but this is the Chatham side of the creek, which the picture taker was standing on the Harwich side. Uh, and you can see the way the, uh, the coastline used to be, and it's hard, you can't tell in here, but there's actually a horse drawn plow that basically scraped out the Chatham side and deposited all that fill here to create the embankment across Muddy Creek. Uh, and 
For many years prior to that, it was called wading place because it's not very deep. Um, and on the right tides, you could actually wade across it to get from one side to the other. Um, but this embankment was put in around 1900, so not dissimilar to when some of the embankments uh, went in here. Many of the embankments that went in on Cape Cod were related to the railroad, not this one. Uh, the railroad that came into Chatham was much further to the south in the central part. So really, putting an embankment here had nothing to do with the railroad. Um, but we haven't really been able to find a good reason as to why, uh, other than the fact that people were concerned about the state of the bridge. Uh, so this is what we ended up with. This was pre-construction. So here's the embankment running along here. This is looking from the Pleasant Bay side of it, upstream, if you will. And basically, while you guys had a number of culverts, we had two little four foot by three foot culverts, about 100 feet in length, uh, from one side of the embankment to the other. And that was supposed to mimic the water flow that had been there you know, for hundreds of years prior to that, from Pleasant Bay up into the creek. It's about a mile and a half from this point up to the headwaters of the creek. If you ever go on Old Queen Anne Road in Chatham, you are actually at the headwaters of Muddy Creek. Um, and from there, there's a couple of herring runs that go underneath Old Queen Anne and up into a couple of ponds up there where herring used to come in to spawn uh, until these head walls were put in with the culverts because the herring don't like that 100 foot transit in the dark. Um, so that pretty well cut off the herring moving upstream. Uh, this is just an aerial photo, uh, aerial photo. So here's Pleasant Bay out here. Muddy Creek kind of comes in, makes an S turn, goes underneath Route 28, and then travels all the way up to the headwaters up here by Old Queen Anne Road. And as I said, there's actually a culvert that goes underneath the road and connects a couple of ponds that theoretically the herring will return to. Uh, back <coughs> at the turn of the century, there was also a dike right about here. Um, and that created the upper portion of the creek really into a freshwater system. And there used to be old cranberry bogs all up in here, right down at creek level. Uh, that dike washed out in the hurricane of 38 and was never put back in after that. Uh, but this is still a very narrow point when you can go to a kayak uh, up the creek, uh, which is absolutely beautiful to do. And in case you're wondering what this star is, that's uh, Eversource power lines uh, that go through the area. Uh, everything on this side of the line, this is the Harwich side, this is all protected open space in Harwich. Uh, they have a couple of well fields up in here, so that is all protected open space. A uh, little subdivision right here. A lot of this land was recently bought by the town of Harwich for preservation purposes. You can see the difference on the Chatham side. Um, this is what we call, um, yeah, of course, this one right out of my head, uh, Riverbend. This was a development that was put in back in the 50s and early 60s. So you can see the Chatham side is pretty well, pretty well completely developed, except for a strip right along the shoreline, which is owned by the Chatham Conservation Foundation. Uh, and that came into play when we were deciding on our, uh, what we were going to do for restoration. So, what were our existing conditions? Very similar to yours, those culverts restricted tidal flow significantly. Um, we had a bacterial TMDL, or total maximum daily load. One of the first bacterial TMDLs in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts was right here at Muddy Creek. Uh, starting in 2006, we had a total nitrogen TMDL. There was actually a series of those at Pleasant Bay, one of which is Muddy Creek. Uh, and the same things that Martha talked about, when you have these tidal restrictions on the upstream side, you lose saltwater wetlands, uh, you have invasion of Phragmites and other freshwater invasive species, you lose shellfish, you lose finfish access, you lose all those important ecological things. So all these restoration projects pretty much have those same kind of things in common. Uh, as I said, we started our uh, look at this site, really, we started our comprehensive wastewater management planning effort in 1996. This was a site that ended up fairly high on the list of things that needed to be fixed uh, in our wastewater plan. And so uh, when our plan came out with Mass, uh, whoops, with Mass DEP, 
going backwards. Which button on the left? And, oh, there you go. Sorry, I guess I didn't go back far enough. Uh, when we finished our uh, estuaries project planning with the state and UMass Dartmouth, everybody's familiar with the Mass Estuaries Project. I'm sure you've probably heard about that. Uh, but that was the effort by the state and UMass Dartmouth to really look, do a comprehensive look at all the marine estuaries in southeastern Massachusetts using the same protocols. So you could compare one to the other as opposed to the way it had been done at before where towns did them individually with different consultants and different ways of doing things and you couldn't compare one estuary to another. So ours was finished in 2003 and as part of that we looked at a number of alternatives early on to mitigate the fact that Muddy Creek was tidally restricted. Uh, it became a priority project with the state, Division of Ecological Restoration in 2008, which means they brought additional resources to evaluate what was going on and what solutions there might be uh, to remediation. Then we got into the real nitty gritty. We did a hydrodynamic model in 2009, which its sole goal was what is the optimum size to restore the opening to and A, get the maximum ecological benefit with the minimal impact on the public and property. All right, as opposed to just going in and say, we're gonna open the whole thing up as big as we can, we spent a lot of time and effort to say, what's the optimal size to achieve those two goals? And two other things, one, not cause erosion on the downstream side or the Pleasant Bay side, and also not to have the opening silt in. So we wanted to size it just right that it would maintain itself naturally so we didn't have to worry about dredging or anything else at any point in the future. So we took all those things into account, worked with a consultant, and came up with the optimal size. Then we spent another almost three, two, three years um, building on the ecological side of things. We had done some of that as part of our earlier 2000s wastewater planning effort but we ended up doing a significant amount more because we started to have some ideas about what the price tag was going to be. And of course, people said, wait a minute, you're going to spend all this money. Let's make sure we know what the benefits are going to be. All right. So we hired a consultant. We spent two years doing water, uh, water quality and ecological quality assessment to really be able to sell people, or not sell them, but explain to people what the benefits were going to be from this project. Yeah, yes, there's going to be some pain, there's going to be detours, there's going to be costs, but here's what you're going to get out of it in the long term. So we, we did that. Uh, we then spent about a year looking at design alternatives. Uh, our original thought was we're simply going to put bigger culverts under the road. That was, that was our first thought, it seemed to make the most sense. Uh, Route 28, as you all know, is a state highway, so MassDOT was involved because it's their road. Uh, early on, they basically, in, in conversations, they basically said, it's our road, we don't need to, we as the state DOT don't need to do anything to that road. It doesn't need to be fixed, because there's nothing wrong with the road. So they said, if you guys, meaning Chatham and Harwich, if you guys want to take the lead and come up with the money to do something, go right ahead. We'll support you but we're not going to bring any state resources. We're not going to bring any mass DOT money. We're not going to bring any mass DOT time uh, to the project because for them, it wasn't necessary to do anything. Uh, they did change a little bit. Ultimately, they, they did put some resources in terms of manpower and stuff like that, but they never really brought any significant amounts of money to the project. Um, well, one of the things that did happen, we were looking at a number of different culvert alternatives uh, ways to get the culvert in place without disturbing the roadway, because at that point Mass Highway was saying you can't you can't close Route 28, um, and so we were looking at jacking culverts underneath or trying to get them underneath some way. All those had significant ecological impacts because it would have expanded the footprint that we were having to uh, work in much more significantly on both the upstream and downstream side. So we were sitting in a, in a meeting one day talking about that, with, and MassDOT had a representative there, um, and he said, well, what about a bridge? And we said, well, you told us we couldn't disturb your road and whatnot. Eh, well, don't worry 
about that. If a bridge makes a better solution, um, that's a good thing. So anyway, um, we ended up with a bridge. Um, we went, went, met with them. Our engineers came up with preliminary designs for a bridge. Uh, we spent two years in design and permitting. Uh, we needed 17 different permits from every agency known to man in Seaglide. Um, believe it or not, we actually had to get a permit from the U.S. Coast Guard because even though Muddy Creek, the entrance channel is about six inches deep at low tide, it's still considered a navigable waterway. So we had to deal with the Coast Guard uh, group out of New York to get a Coast Guard permit to do the work we did. So yeah, a long permitting effort. Uh, but I can tell you that we had good cooperation from most of the permitting agencies. Uh, you know, we didn't get any roadblocks thrown at us that you know were insurmountable. So I have to say, even though it, you know it took two years, um, it worked out pretty well. Uh, and I think we, we learned a lot, and I think other organizations doing the same thing can learn a lot as well. Uh, so basically, from 2008. The 2015 design permitting assessment only took us five months to build the bridge. <laughs> um, at the same time, and this is an aside, Mastock was building a wooden bridge in Chatham that many of you may have heard about. It took them two years. <laughs> it only took us five months. Uh, so, very similar to what Martha already talked about, what are all the benefits? You know, increased tidal range, improvements to fisheries, improvements to wetlands, conversion of wetlands from fresh and brackish water to saltwater wetlands. Every agency places a higher ecological value on saltwater wetlands as opposed to freshwater wetlands or brackish water wetlands. You know, they may see some people say, well, wait a minute, you're changing it from freshwater wetland to saltwater wetland. What's the big deal? Much higher ecological value with saltwater wetlands. You know, and that's something that sometimes it's hard for the public to understand. What's the difference between that plant and that plant? Um, this is some of the modeling that we did with our consultants early on uh, with the project. So uh, this side here showed the pre various classes of wetlands and you can see when you get up to basically where that dike is pretty much from there down it's pretty much salt water type of environment salt water wetlands for the most part uh, and above that dike primarily fresh water or brackish water wetlands now one of the interesting thing is very similar you know in a lot of places on cape cod it's not like we have a big freshwater river running into this estuary so a lot of people are like, well, where do you get all this freshwater wetlands? It's all groundwater seepage from the surrounding watershed. You go down to these places at low tide, and you can actually see the fresh water seeping out into the estuary. Everybody knows what an estuary is, right? Somebody tell me what an estuary is. An estuary is a place where fresh and salt water mix. Okay? So whenever anybody talks about an estuary, you know it's a place where fresh and salt water meet together and mix. So this whole upper portion, really the dike was kind of the controlling, the old dike was the controlling factor. A lot of fresh water coming in from up here, so much so that for the most part this area was fresh water. We, had, we measured salinities down you know, as low as two and three parts per million. In this area, when salinity is up here, it might be 18 or 20. Salinity in Pleasant Bay might be 25 or 30. So, you know, there was even an impact in this portion here. And then once the restoration was complete, you can see we've shifted pretty much completely over uh, to saltwater or saltwater brackish type wetlands, uh, which is, that was our goal. That's what we wanted to see. Uh, fish and shellfish, the whole inside, so everything north of Route 28 has been closed to shell fishing for decades uh, because of high bacterial counts. In addition, over time, because of the restricted flow, there's a huge amount of organic sediments that have built up on the bottom. Everybody talks, and I know well, Fleet Harbor, you guys have the issue with the black mayonnaise, as everybody calls it. You know, these soupy, disgusting sediments. 
And in sections of Muddy Creek, there's four to five feet of that. So not conducive to growing any type of shellfish. Uh, and then the same issues with the American eel and all the fish that used to go up there and didn't work at that point in time. Did the sediment work its way out or what happened? It did not. And that's one of the, you know, there were a number of things when we were working on this project and we finally settled on the design and all. That's what a lot of people were concerned about. One, a couple of things. One, moving all that sediment out into Pleasant Bay and having a negative impact. Two, on either side of the mouth out in Pleasant Bay are public beaches. One on the Chatham side, one on the Harwich side. So there was a lot of concern that when we opened this up, because of the high bacterial counts in the creek, were we going to export that high bacteria out and end up with beach closures? And again, that was all part of our analysis of the optimum size of the opening was to not cause those things to happen. And then the third thing was we have exceedingly high nitrogen levels up in the creek. And again, when we opened it up, were we going to export all that nitrogen from there out into Pleasant Bay and have an impact? All those things were modeled as part of sizing that opening. And I can say, safely say to date, we have not had a negative impact from any of those three. And we're continually monitoring you know, to make sure. Uh, in terms of the, the mayonnaise bottom, that is naturally, over time, going to reduce itself down. So not necessarily by flushing out, but simply by improved water quality and ecological value that organic material will begin to break down over time. You know, I've been telling people this is not something that, you know, we're going to open it up and the next year everything's improved. It's going to take probably 5, 10, 15 years to see all the improvements that we hope to see. Uh, one of the, obviously, one of the major concerns was impact to private property. Um, and really, really more fundamental to that what's going to happen to the tides when we do these openings so one of the things we did was working with our consultants we said okay what are the current tides where does it how does it impact the adjoining property on either side of the creek what's going to happen when we change it all right so right oops, sorry you did the wrong one all right so right in between here that's really the current water area and then, you know, you've got this fringing marsh along the edge on both sides. These white lines, those are power lines. We're waiting to see if all the cormorants that don't have a roosting place are going to down here. And if they do, I'm sending them back. Not that we don't have our own cormorants already, but I'm just hoping we don't get any new uh, influence in. So this is the current water area, if you will, under normal conditions. This will be in between the blue line, the darker blue line. That will be the new spring high tide levels. So, you know, there will be some inundation of these salt mark, uh, the salt mark, the marshes along the immediate edges. And, and we knew that. We planned for that. Uh, but we also looked at flood tides because obviously, you know, it's one thing to have average conditions, but we're now opening this up to Pleasant Bay as a whole. You know, 2007, we had another break in the Nauset Barrier Beach, which raised tide levels throughout Pleasant Bay. Right about the same time we were, you know, doing all this planning. So everybody's like, okay, what impact is that going to have? And then what's going to happen in the storm? You know, we all know we get these nor'easters, and now with that new inlet in the bay, uh, in the Barrier Beach, the chance of getting higher tide, storm tides, was going to be much more significant. So we basically modeled those. On, on all the entire shoreline, each one of these lines is different. The red being pretty much the worst case scenario. Uh, and the reason why it's only a 35-year storm, and the, you know everybody talks about like 50 or 100-year storms. You know the blizzard of '78 was a 100-year storm and had much higher tide levels. The reason why we used 35 was because as you go from Chatham to Harwich on Route 28. The road goes down, and when you get to the Harwich side, it's almost down to the same level as the bed. So even if we didn't build the bridge, when you exceed 11 and a half feet, Route 28 floods, and so floodwaters would get up in the Muddy Creek. So on like the 50 and 100 year storms, the road is the low point, irrespective of 
what we did putting the bridge in. All right, so that's why we ended up at this elevation with this storm, which is kind of a weird one, you know, not normally talked about. Anything above that would, would have flooded anyway. Uh, and so what we did is we did these for the entire shoreline, and then we ended up printing these out for each individual property owner. We sent them to each individual property owner, and I probably met individually with probably 15 or 20 property owners that had specific questions. You know, some people called and emailed, in other cases, you know, like I say, I actually went out and met with the property owners to walk them through you know, what this was showing and what the impacts on their individual properties would be. Now, one advantage that we had, um, if you remember back to that kind of overview slide, Muddy Creek's relatively long and narrow, and the embankments on each side are fairly steep. So there really weren't any homes that were down along the creek. Septic systems, for the most part, were all up on the embankments. Uh, we only really identified one house this one here, where there would actually be impacts to the property. Um, and as you can see, even at the, you know, our worst case tide uh, storm surge, wouldn't get to the house itself. But because, you know, the property owner rightly had concerns, uh, we ended up going in and flood proofing her basement. Because she had a walkout basement with a door and a, a couple <coughs> windows on this side. So we went in, we flood proofed her basement for her, we moved her utilities up, uh, things like that. And that was really the only one that we had that potentially was in harm's way. And you know, frankly, in a hundred year storm, she would have been impacted whether or not we did what we did. But we said, hey, you know, we're gonna take care of you because we're doing this project. Uh, so we spent a lot of time and effort dealing with property owners that might uh, potentially the impact and, and working to alleviate, you know, concerns. Hey, your septic system's not an issue. It's, you know, 35 feet up the embankment and only extends down eight feet. You're still well above any levels that, you know, might be uh, caused by the new project. Um, you know, we end up evaluating a lot of different alternatives from, you know, box culverts. Um, like this, the rounded box culverts to a short bridge, a uh, bridge with um, piles and whatnot. Ultimately, we settled on a 93 foot single span bridge, no pilings to provide any obstructions to flow. Uh, this is the design that we came up with 21 feet wide at the base. That was the magic number. Get to 21 feet wide, you've got the water flow we wanted. There won't be any scouring and there won't be any siltation uh, going forward. And that is, that is proven true. Uh, this was our entire project site. So this is the Chatter site. We actually have what's known as Jackknife Harbor Beach down here. So there is, there is an access road that goes down to that. Uh, this is the Harwich side. This is that low area I talked about. Once you kind of get down to here, the road is basically so low that it floods practically in every nor'easter. Uh, and so no matter what we did here, the water level in Pleasant Bay gets high enough, it'll flood here, it'll flood here as well and impact the entire system. Uh, but this is where we put the bridge in. We basically rebuilt Mass High uh, Route 28 from here uh, down to here. And we basically excavated this entire section out and put the bridge in. Uh, we put riprap under along the bottom of the new channel, as well as up the sides. And these green areas are just areas where uh, the slopes were impacted. That's just a more detailed view of what it looks like. Um, what impacts did we have on wetlands? Um, because we were working right in the wetlands. I mean, there was no way to get around. Uh, and so we had impacts to coastal beach, coastal dunes, salt marsh, the whole gamut. Uh, we had temporary <coughs> construction impacts, obviously. And then we did have some permanent impacts uh, with about 6,000 square feet loss of wetlands of you know, three types. And the agencies were okay with that uh, because we were basically restoring 55 acres of wetlands. So only about a tenth of what you guys are dealing with. 
but we had to go through all this detail with the permitting agency so that everybody clearly understood it. Yeah, there's going to be impacts. There's, there's no way to do these kind of projects without impacts. Uh, we had a detour, which everybody loved. You know, <laughs> there's no way to get around. Actually, the detour worked out really well. <laughs> yeah, we had almost no complaints about the detour. Uh, even though, you know, depending on which way you were going, um, you know, it was fairly lengthy. Um, but yeah, we, didn't, we had no issues with it, but there was no other way to do it. Uh, so now just some construction photos. This was, a, oops, this was about day, this was the morning of day two. So you can see the embankment, they ripped the pavement out, they're starting to dig that embankment out. Um, once that was done, we had, we had an issue, well, we had an issue, issue because we were doing this in the middle of winter to minimize the impacts. Uh, National Grid had a 10-inch gas main that went along Route 28 over here. And being the winter, they said, we can't turn it off because it's winter time. We have to provide gas to people. So before we started the excavation, we basically had to build a temporary bridge, relocate their gas main onto the temporary bridge, and maintain that throughout the entire construction sequence until we were able to put the gas main back on the bridge. So that was kind of interesting because now you've got this big structure here that you're trying to maneuver all your heavy equipment and whatnot around. So once they got this carved out to a certain level, so we're about six feet above the creek, uh, we basically put a huge coffer dam around the entire uh, creek area so that they could actually excavate the creek in the dry. Right? So basically, because what we had to do obviously was maintain creek flow throughout the entire project. So we basically built it in half. So here we are, with the Chatham side is done. They're working on the Harwich side, they have the coffer dam around it. And interestingly enough, when they were working on this side, we actually found some of the old wooden pilings off the original bridge that were there at the turn of the century, uh, which was really kind of neat. Uh, but it was an interesting, you know, work on one side, coffer dam it, dig it out, put all the riprap in, switch over, do the same thing on the other side, all the while maintaining this temporary bridge and gas pan. Question. Was the original bridge, wooden bridge, situated pretty much where? Pretty much in the exact same spot. Yep. Yep. Uh, this was the day that we opened up the uh, coffer dam that had been temporarily blocking it while work was done. And you can see the difference in elevation between the upstream side and the uh, downstream side. We're already seeing that impact of time. Uh, this is what it looked like once everything was out of there. And you can see areas now upstream being flooded that hadn't seen salt water in decades. Uh, one thing we did, which is really kind of neat, was we used what's known as ABC, Accelerated Bridge Construction. So pretty much the entirety of the bridge was prefabricated off-site. Um, a lot of the columns, most of the concrete components uh, were manufactured in Massachusetts, in Western Mass, and arrived on, by truck. And the bridge components themselves were actually manufactured in New York State. Uh, they came in with the girders with the bridge deck already on it. This was, this was where MassDOT did lend a hand because we used a company that MassDOT uses frequently. So they already had their bridge inspectors at the firm because they insisted, because they were going to take ownership when it was done, they insisted that they have their own inspectors inspect. Um, and so we said, that's fine, we'll pay for it. Uh, and we ended up kind of splitting the cost with them, which worked out fine, because their inspectors were already in New York on other bridge projects. Uh, but it was kind of neat. We brought in, frankly, one of the biggest cranes that I've ever seen operating on Cape Cod uh, to lift these things in place. Um, they left New York State at like 9 o'clock at night, got here about 8 o'clock the next morning. They had to shut down the Sagamore Bridge when they brought them over because these things were about, uh, they're 90 feet long and they were about 16 feet wide. So, you know, they had to have state police escorts all the way from New York to the site. 
they rolled up at like 8 o'clock in the morning. We staged them. The crane arrived, set up. That whole bridge substructure was in place at the end of the day. I mean, it was absolutely amazing. Uh, here's just some more shots where they're, you know, lowering. That's the first beam being lowered in place. And here they all are. You can see the bridge deck, for the most part, is already there. And the contractor would pour in between and pour the ends. But yeah, ABC Construction is what MassDOT uses on a lot of the work they do, you know, on 95 and all that, where they shut the thing down on Friday night and they reopen it Monday morning. Because everything's prefab and they just come in and drop it in place. Uh, this is what it looked like shortly after being finished. So there's our new bridge, Rip Route, Route 28. Um, we did have discussions with MassDOT about the fact that this is the low area on the Harwich side. And we said, you know, while we're doing this, do you guys want to think about raising the road up a bit so it doesn't flood in every nor'easter? They didn't do it. <laughs> uh, I think they're rethinking that thought now. You know, after last winter when that road flooded like multiple times. Uh, the other things that were kind of interesting was because it was a new bridge and it's Route 28, they originally wanted sidewalks on both sides. They wanted bike lanes on both sides. So we were looking at this big, huge bridge, uh, you know, which in and of itself isn't bad, but it would have drastically increased the amount of uh, wetland impact because it would have been that much bigger. So we worked with our consulting engineers and mass guide and ultimately agreed we put a bike path on one side and a sidewalk on one side. Because there's, you know, once you get past here in the Chatham side, and once you get past here in the Harvard side, there's no other sidewalks. So it's not like, you know, you're walking for 10 miles on the sidewalks. Um, what we did do is right, right here, here, right at the edge of this, exactly. is the driveway that goes down to Jackknife Beach in Harwich, I mean in Chatham. And Harwich has head of the Bay Beach over here with a small parking along the side of the road. So we did agree that we would extend, instead of having the sidewalks and all just on the bridge itself, we did agree to extend the sidewalks to connect the two beaches. So basically now you can park at Jackknife Harbor Beach in Chatham and safely walk over to head of the Bay Beach in Harwich. Um, and I think that's been pretty well received by, you know, everybody in the communities. Um, just two aerial photos. Uh, this is what it looked like pre-construction. This is what it looks like today. One of the things, one of the concerns that a lot of people had was, you can see we had this nice S-shaped curve here. A lot of people were concerned when we put the bridge in and increased the flow, that this would try to straighten out. Well, here you are. Um, a year and a half afterwards, and that S curve is pretty much the same as it was. And I can tell you, even to this day, it's pretty much the same as it was. And that was because of all the time and effort spent on that hydrodynamic analysis to find that sweet spot. Um, so we didn't create any other issues. Um, tide information. So this little line right here, uh, let me start with the big one. This line, these big lines here, are the tide in Pleasant Bay. So out in the bay itself, that's the tide range. This little dotted line right here in the middle, it hardly moves at all, that was the tide on the upstream side. So in the bay itself, you're about three feet. Upstream, about six inches. That's pre-construction. This is post-construction, right? So the high tides are just about the same. The low tides in Pleasant Bay get a little bit lower than they do up in Muddy Creek. And that's just because Muddy Creek is long and narrow. So it doesn't, takes it longer to flush. So by the time when Pleasant Bay is already at its lowest point, you can see the tide in Muddy Creek is still going out. And Pleasant Bay is already coming back in again before Muddy Creek is completely empty. But significantly better than it was. And the other thing we did was we did salt marsh, uh, edge of marsh surveys along this area of concern. So we had surveys done pre-construction and a couple times post-construction to just show that the really, you know, the velocities in all three here are just right. They're not causing things to wash out and this to straighten out. Because that was one of the 
that was one of the concerns that people had. <coughs> because this is where Jack Knife Harbor Beach is in Chatham. So if this is blown through, potentially we would have lost that beach. Uh, but that hasn't happened. Uh, water quality, we have two stations. This one here, just upstream of the, where the new bridge is. And then we have one further up here towards the headwaters. Uh, the first thing we noticed right after we did it, uh, we, we reopened the, uh, the opening in, in May of 2016. So the first summer after that, we not, saw a significant increase in salinity. These are the salinities beforehand at the two different stations, the higher salinities down towards Pleasant Bay, and then the salinities upstream. And you can see they're getting pretty close to fresh and brackish water up here. Once we did the opening, both areas were up in the 20 to, to 30 parts per thousand range in salinity, which is pretty comparable to what's in Pleasant Bay itself. So that was kind of our first immediate, yeah, this is working, because this was the first summer right after we did the open. Um, we've also done, we also do dissolved oxygen. This one's a little harder to read, uh, and not as obvious, but one of, whoops, one of the things we saw right away was if you notice the spread between these, these are both oxygen, just one's on a 100% scale and one's the absolute value. But the thing is to look at the spread. So this is all pre-construction. And once we have the construction, look how our range is really narrowed down. So we're not getting real wide springs in, uh, spring in dissolved oxygen anymore, which is much better for the life uh, that's in there because once you start getting once you start getting down in this range, you know, that's when you start seeing negative impact to fish and shellfish. You know, the fish can move, but the shellfish that are living in that bottom, if that dissolved oxygen goes too low, they're stuck. Um, and the upper creek station, again, you know, huge swings. And after construction, much tighter. So that indicated to us that things were drastically improving. Uh, and then probably the biggest one for us is the nutrient data. Um, there's a lot here, but just concentrate on this blue area. Uh, these, this is total nitrogen, right? Which is really what we use when we're trying to decide the impact of these estuaries and wastewater disposal and other kinds of things. Uh, we only have one year of post data so far, but you know, that pretty much that first year it dropped down to the lowest we've seen since 2000. So that indicated to us that there was improvement in the system. Where, where do you want the nitrogen level? Uh, ideally, see this little blue dotted line right here? Yeah. That's the nitrogen level in the Atlantic Ocean water just to the east of us. So it'd be wonderful if we could get down to that level. I don't think we'll ever get there because we're inside the system, all right? But that's kind of our, this is the, what we call background or boundary condition in the Atlantic Ocean. So theoretically, we can't get any better than that, but it'd be nice to get as close as we can to that. Um, and this is the station that's in the upper part of the system. Um, and you can see, again, the lowest, below, kind of interesting, because um, 2016 was the first summer after we did the bridge, and you know, right away we had two stations, or two summers, that were the lowest we'd ever seen in the entire period we were monitoring. Um, and we did see, uh, we really didn't see it as much in the chlorophyll levels, which are an indication of how much algal biomass is in the system. Uh, you know, this one, yeah, it's a little bit lower. I can't wait for the 2018 data. We usually get that about April, so I'm really waiting to see what, what 2018 looks like. Hopefully these declining trends continue and maybe even get further down. Uh, we just recently did a, one of the things we had done beforehand was a number of transects and photo surveys of what all the vegetation along the shoreline looked like. We just repeated that last fall. We issued the report in January of this year. Uh, and basically within two years, we were seeing substantial changes in the, in the, the plant communities along the creek. Um, as expected, there were areas that used to have plants on them that were now bare mud bottom. But the reason expected, 
we killed off all the freshwater plants, the saltwater plants were gradually starting to colonize. That's why I said five, 10, 15 years to really see these systems totally uh, transition over. Uh, we did see some die off in Phragmites, but not statistically significant. Phragmites is kind of in that sweet spot. Phragmites doesn't like salt, so it tends to be right at the, the shoreline edge of the embankments where all the fresh water is coming in. So it's going to take a little bit longer to deal with that uh, because that fresh water is always going to be coming in from the up gradient areas. Um, but I think one thing that's really telling, and, and the reason why I put it in there, is this. Things, when you do something like this, they're going to get worse before it gets better. And we spent a lot of time, before we did this project, getting that message out to the public. That yeah, within the first couple of years, it's liable to look pretty bad. You know, if you, if you compare it to the old photos, of everything was nice and green and lush, Right afterwards, you're gonna see bare stuff. You're gonna see dead and dying trees and shrubs and stuff. But gradually, it will shift back to a good looking system. Uh, and it is just, I, I always throw this one in because we put, as part of our project, we put riprap up to about here along the edge of it. And we said to Mass Highway, don't you want us to bring that riprap further up? You know, sea level rise and greater storms. And that's how I said, no, 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 you got it high enough. After the spring nor'easters last year, within about a week, Mass Highway was there extending that stone all the way up to the edge of the road. Uh, what we would have done as part of our project and paid for it. <coughs> so, uh, <coughs> is that where they might raise the road? <laughs> Yeah, this is the area, the chatter side's over here, we're nice and high. This is the area where you get into harvest, where you get low. It frequently overwashes in, in nor'easters. So I think at some point, Mass Dot is going to be looking at raising the road here. Um, part of this whole coastal resiliency discussion. Uh, because, you know, it's Route 28, it's a major road to have that flood for two or three days after a nor'easter. Um, and there's actually a, a, a single family house down here, and their front yard is frequently just full of debris because it gets pushed right into their yard. And then Mastod has to come in with a front end loader and basically clear the road off because of all the, you know, the, the wood and everything else that, that accumulates there. So. Recreational commercial shellfishing and fishing, 
Um, again, we're also very dependent on recre uh, recreation and visitors here on the Cape. Um, and they provide aesthetic value. It's kind of part of the, the natural beauty and nature of the Cape um, in all different seasons, including fall colors. Um, the other important benefit is to focus on the ecosystem services. So this is where the natural processes of the environment provide a benefit to humans. <coughs> so the common one is protection of water quality. Wetlands have the ability to help um, remove uh, pollutants from stormwater runoff from our roads and highways, removing some of those heavy metals, but also things like our nutrients, nitrogen. They help with to uptake. The problem is we're putting so much nutrients into the system and they're getting overwhelmed in many cases in our coastal waters. Um, they help with storm damage prevention. Um, large salt marsh systems can help dampen wave energy and actually slow down the flow, reduce the impact of major storm surge. Um, they prevent inland erosion, so if you have structures inland, you have a, a wetland in between that can actually prevent erosion, particularly thinking back to the nor'easters last year, um, things on the coast where you just have dunes or very minimal natural systems left, those were the structures that were um, most impacted from those storm events. They help really fortify that shoreline. And as Martha mentioned, we often think of with climate change and, and uptake of carbon in the atmosphere, we look to forests as a way to help with that, but wetlands, um, there's a lot more studies focused on that now, are also a good um, source or habitat to help with that carbon uptake. After Hurricane Sandy, um, the Nature Conservancy completed a study that estimated that coastal wetlands in the Northeast actually prevented about $625 million in property damage. So again, it has a um, net benefit to us in our infrastructure as well as the environmental benefit. So I'm going to speak about three projects. Um, the first is one that is still ongoing and in planning. I'm not going to go as much detail as kind of the design and the studies that went into them, but um, some of the benefits that we're expecting and, and the monitoring that we've particularly been involved with. So this first one, Parker's River, is in Yarmouth on the south side. Um, this is a picture from the salt marsh looking south. Um, this is a bridge at Route 28 that flows out to Nantucket Sound. So looking at the map, so here's Nantucket Sound, Parker's River runs up. Here, this is Route 28 here. This is that bridge. The river continues through about 60 acres of salt marsh um, through Seine or Swan Pond, which is about 93 acres, which is a tidally influenced pond, so it gets salt water in there. And then continues up further to Long Pond, which is 63 acre freshwater pond <coughs> used by herring as a spawning habitat. Um, the current condition is this 18 foot span, so not nearly as restricted, although if you compare it to um, Heron River, it's a much smaller scale project. So one thing to kind of keep in mind, there's a lot of similarities in all these, but planning and implementation um, should fit the scale of the project as well. So it's 18 feet, but if you look at the full width of the stream, it's much narrower. So whenever you think of salt marsh restorations, a lot of them are tidal restorations. So right now, what we're doing is we're restricting that tidal flow. It's a tidal restriction. So the result of that, um, it restricts that flow. We get less salt water upstream, um, less ability for that sediment to naturally transport, and the result is it impairs the salt marsh. Salt marsh plants um, survive the specific salinity level. Um, uh, invasives like Phragmites you see here thrive when you don't have as much salt water. This system, we don't see a lot of Phragmites in the salt marsh itself. This photo is actually from up near the pond um, where they have a boardwalk that the community uses, and that doesn't get enough salt water at this point. Likewise, um, that same pond is not getting proper flushing. The town um, monitors the water quality there, and they've had significant issues with high nitrogen levels. This is actually the entrance or the exit of St. Pond as you go up the fish run towards Long Pond. Huge algal blooms making it sometimes almost impassable. Um, and they've also had issues with fish kills because of that low dissolved oxygen that results from those algal blooms dying off. So all of these are issues that um, we're trying to address with this project. Um, another big issue is um, dealing with this restriction is it holds back storm surge both on, on both ends, and I'll show you some data on that. Um, but because of this restriction, we get major um, events with waters coming from the south. You get kind of water pushing up and not able to move through there. Um, in the same event, actually, uh, the nor'easters last year in the spring, particularly the ones in March, um, 
the floodwaters that, that up there, it took two weeks for them to actually exit and the water levels to go down. Because these restrictions create a bottleneck. So often we look at, with the modeling, potential flooding to your surrounding areas. But also important to understand that if you leave these restrictions in place, um, you have a risk of flooding because of that bottleneck they, they create. Um, this restriction also causes a lot of higher flow, higher velocity and speed of water going underneath there, which is a barrier for herring um, going upstream. Um, people also go under here with their kayaks. It's rather dangerous. Um, the town doesn't encourage it because it's such high speeds and not a lot of headroom at this point. Um, when this was started, again, this is Route 28, it's an, a DOT-owned um, road, similar to Muddy Creek. DOT has been reviewing the design, um, but they have not been paying for the project. When the project began in planning, um, in terms of their site, the, the bridge was fine, the road was fine. Um, more recently, we've seen this bridge degrading. Um, you can see some of the rebar here coming through. So at this point, there's also concern about this bridge structurally, potentially. So there's a benefit to public safety. Um, and this is a major route, obviously, um, to have that replaced. So the plan is to replace it with a 30-foot span bridge, which is much closer to the full width of the stream. So um, this planning has been going on for quite some time. APCC did initial monitoring back in 2011. We're getting closer to finishing up permitting now, so we did further monitoring um, in 2017 and 2018 with the anticipation that um, construction may start this year or next year. So um, we do a lot with vegetation monitoring, setting up transects, in this case eight transects. This is the river and the salt marsh surrounding, so on both sides. Um, along those lines, we set up kind of one meter square areas that we're looking at at intervals, so we can look at the overall change in the plants. So when we're doing that, so we have these one meter square plots that we lay down at um, specific locations. We're trying to identify what plants are there to see change in kind of relative proportion. So we look within there and kind of estimate the relative percent cover of different plants so we can see a change in what species are present and how um, dominant they are. And when there is Phragmites, we um, get an estimate of those and measure how tall they are again with the expectation that increased salinity will reduce phragmite size and spread. Um, in this marsh, again, there's not a lot of phragmite here except fringing, as you can see on the edge. So we're not um, expecting to see a significant change in the vegetation here. Um, this is our 2017 results. The key thing is that alternate flora um, is the main dominant species, followed by several species that are typically in middle marsh. Um, there's 15 species overall. Um, Halophytes are generally those salt-loving plants that you find in salt marshes. 98% of the plant growth is halophytes. Um, so we're not seeing a significant degradation in terms of the plants there. Very little, less than 1% of Phragmites. Most of it's near that upland fringe. So we may see some reduction in that, um, but not a huge change in the vegetation. What we do think we might see um, with a relatively small tidal change of about six inches is a shifting of the line of that marsh. So again, this is kind of the marsh area here. And what we did is we mapped the edge between the low marsh which is dominated by um, Spartina alternate flora and mid marsh, so that green line is the edge of the low marsh. And then between the high marsh and the upland, which is shown here in yellow. Um, so there's no uh, expectation of <coughs> flooding of properties, there's not really any infrastructure nearby the marsh itself. We want to be able to kind of see that change over time, and we're hoping that this will help inform when we, what we may see in salt marshes over time with increasing sea level rise. We go through all of this and, and do photo documentation um, at the quadrats, looking along transects and kind of higher level from bridge inside of the marsh. Um, this photo in particular shows the change from 2011 when we first set up these transects to 2017. Um, we have lost some of that marsh along the edge, which it looks like is a combination of um, impacts from purple salt marsh crab, which is an invasive, it's kind of Swiss cheesy look. Um, as well as um, these areas really close to the bridge where we have that really high speed water um, with a lot of issues with erosion. So um, with doing nothing, we're losing portions of the marsh and also kind of getting shoaling and shallow areas that are making it hard for both fish and shellfishing. Looking on the transects, when we combine this um, 
image looking on the transect with our mapping, so here looking along. We can kind of get a visual with both the picture and the map of kind of changes in vegetation. This is a slightly higher area that's dominated by IVA. So over time, you can look visually and with the map to see if any of that produces. This is a slightly less salt tolerant plant you find in marshes. And then again, we look at the tidal hydrology looking at changes in elevation and salinity. So we have our free data looking at downstream of the bridge. Um, here's where the bridge is slightly upstream and then in the pond. Um, again, one of the things that's been well studied in this site through the MEP reports but that we've seen in our monitoring is that bottleneck effect. So um, upstream, low tide is always typically two hours delayed from when it is downstream or essentially out in the bays. And again, it's because of that bottleneck effect. Um, so trying to time that similar to what Bob mentioned, um, by the time it's reaching low tide, the tide would change outside and start to come back in. That's essentially what happened here as we were leaving one day. We didn't quite get out before the tides were coming back in to um, food full of water. So this is that tidal data. The black line, again, it goes up and down with the change in tide each day. That's downstream. Um, this is the location upstream, which is here in red. Blue is in the pond. The big difference to show is that Again, downstream, we've got five foot tidal range. Upstream, immediately upstream, as well as up in the pond, it's only about one to two feet. So significant restriction. So that's really a measure of the impact. Um, this was a storm event in the fall of 2017 when these were out. And you can see the water levels going up. So we had about two inches of rain. So upstream, the water levels went up and stayed up over a period of 24, 48 hours. And then downstream, we had kind of 20, 50 mile an hour winds, again, pushing water in from the ocean against that too. So again, with that bottleneck, you're getting flooding often um, on both sides, which should be alleviated when we replace that bridge. Um, and again, here you can see the lag time. So you have the uh, high tide here downstream, and then high tides later. Same thing, low tide, and then low tide later upstream. Looking at salinity, um, typical ocean salinity, full salinity is about 35, and our coastal waters might be closer to 30. Fresh water is generally less than four parts per thousand. Um, again, the black line is downstream. The red line, in this case, is immediately upstream. There's not a huge difference, except that upstream, it doesn't get quite as salty. All the way up in the pond, um, the range is closer to 1927. Uh, parts per thousand. Again, showing it is tidally influenced, but we're not getting as much flushing up there, which in part is why we're having issues with high nutrient levels within that pond. Um, but there's a lot more variability in the pond. Again, as Bob mentioned, you have groundwater and freshwater influences. So a lot of this variability is from that, as well as you know rain or other runoff going into that pond. We also started in 2016 in anticipation of the, the um, bridge replacement monitoring and pairing. So this is done by volunteers, visual counts. Um, so initially 2016, 917, um, the Mass Division of Marine Fisheries has an algorithm to then estimate the overall size of that run, which was about 9,000, which is kind of between a small and medium if we compare it across the Cape. In the last couple years, we've seen that decline to very few um, at all last year, despite some pretty um, devoted volunteers going out looking for them, not only where they normally count, but up and down the street. Um, this is particularly startling because 2016 was a drought year, and this system um, has some pretty shallow areas, so it, it tends to have challenges in drought years, and 2018 was not. We can't say what the cause of this was. We have looked across the region, and we have overall seen in a lot of um, runs a decline. So we're, we don't think this is necessarily something with this project, but overall within the region. So I think that's something to keep in mind when we look at the impacts of the before and after. Because it's not what's just happening within your system, but looking across the region, that really helps you to understand the impacts. But again, clearly we have an issue and we're hoping that um, we'll see a rebound in the herring. So summarizing kind of all of those benefits, when we think about benefits, they're both ecological and societal. You know, replacing um, that bridge that's aging, Reducing velocity erosion, reducing that bottleneck and flooding are all kind of societal benefits. Um, meanwhile, increasing the salinity, reducing those nutrients. I should say um, the Parker's River does have a, a TMDL because it's been identified as a nutrient impaired water body. And um, 
the whole river system up through most of that same pond is only conditionally approved for shellfish, with the very <coughs> upper reaches um, with it prohibited. So we're looking to hopefully have benefit. There are people um, that do go out and shellfish in that area. Um, when you look at costs again, we look at kind of societal and monetary costs. In this case, a lot of the societal are temporary. Um, in this case, the bridge is planned um, to always be open during construction. They're not going to pull the bridge out entirely, um, so they want to maintain that. There's not a really good way to route people around, so they'll do work on the south side of the bridge, moving both lanes of traffic <coughs> to the north side, and then move everyone to the south side of the bridge to work on the north side. So there will be additional traffic, but the bridge will always be open. Um, they've worked the town very closely with the neighbor, uh, neighbors, which are several businesses, um, put into place temporary easements. All of their um, parking areas and businesses will be able to be open, but some of them have two accesses and one of those will be blocked. Um, so in some cases they're providing easements. Um, other businesses have um, moved ahead completely supportive. Um, minimal flooding, and the reason I say minimal is with those normal um, modeled uh, tides, they're not expecting any flooding of any structures or businesses. It's only when you get to those kind of 10, 20 year floods, similar to Bob's case, if it were a 100 year storm event, it's going to flood over Route 28. So there's really nothing we can do about that. Um, but in those interim kind of flooding events, there are four properties around the pond where some structures on their property, including a shed, um, a crawl space, not really a basement, um, and an older structure further down on their property could be impacted. So the town worked with each of those to get agreements in place. And I think in one case, do mitigation um, to, pre to prevent flooding into that crawl space under their building. Um, the total estimated cost here includes everything from design, permitting, through construction. It's about five million, five and a half million dollar project. Um, and I just kind of want to point out the sources of those funding. A lot of it um, does come from federal funding. Grants like through NOAA, um, they have very consistent kind of annual funding available for projects such as these. And I know there are several projects around the Cape that have received funding through NOAA. Um, DER, the Division of Ecological Restoration of State and the Cape Cod Conservation District Local, um, NRCS, um, which is also federal, has provided some additional funds. And the town, in this case, is putting in about $800,000. But the most significant portion actually came from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Sandy funds or um, recovery funds. So there's um, opportunities when there are big impacts from storm events that funding becomes available. Um, and those types of funds would be available for a project like Herring River as well. So the second project I want to talk about, kind of going back in time, was the Stony Brook um, restoration was done in 2010, so this is in Brewster on the north side of the Cape. Um, so this is, in this case here, Route 6 A. The river comes through here, goes underneath through a small culvert. We have 20 acres of salt marsh, as well as a lot of upstream fish habitat that was impaired. So degraded salt marsh, um, invasion of phragmites, more phragmites than what we see at Parker's River. And again, here it's a much um, more significant restriction. This is a picture of it before a small pipe going underneath. Um, so it really prevents that natural movement of sediment. Um, it creates faster water movement, erosion, and damage to the habitat. Um, it was really not good passage for herring either. And this culvert, in fact, before it was replaced, was actually failing, slowly being kind of crushed. Um, this is, again, that tidal data. Um, this is pretty far upstream, relatively speaking, where we have this road crossing not as close to the ocean. Um, so it's not as significant difference to this blue line from downstream to upstream, but it, there is a clear restriction there. So the goal was to restore this kind of 20 acre area um, upstream of Route 6A here, um, proof fish to get to that 386 acres of um, spawning habitat in the ponds and another 3,000 feet of stream habitat. Um, and this right here is the Cape Cod Natural History Museum. So they were very involved in this project um, and have ownership over portions of this land and trails through here. So um, trying to balance kind of the improvement here while continuing to provide access to the public to use this space as well. So we started with a four foot undersized Piper culvert here and replaced it with an 18 foot box culvert in 2010. 
looking at the salinity, there's not a huge obvious difference. And part of it is because it's further upstream. So again, this line indicates when the restoration was done. The blue is downstream, the green is upstream. Um, so particularly before you can see this large gap in difference in salinity, overall the salinity is kind of between 20 and 10. So it's not as salty because it's further from the ocean. But we do see some reduction in um, that gap. So getting higher salinity levels, looking at these lows and going up in that um, upstream restored area. And the effect of that is a little more obvious when you look at some of the vegetation. So particularly when we look at areas that had Phragmites, apologies, this doesn't show up really well. In 2007, before the restoration, we mapped out areas kind of shown here with these little red dots. Um, so there's a big patch of Phragmites here downstream along this path from the, the History Museum this huge area, and overall um, we saw reduction, particularly close to where that culvert was replaced. So again, we're getting more salt in here, it's killing off a lot of that. Up here, further upstream, we're not getting as much of that tidal influence in part to preserve um, access to these walkways. We still have a lot of fragments. So again, it depends on the, the project goals, the extent of the restoration. In this case, um, the determination was to only open up this. There's actually another culvert here, which could have been opened up further to increase that. But again, there, there was a goal to also maintain this um, public access. The Herring Run actually, I think, is one of the largest changes. So again, looking over time, this is Stony Brook. Before, it averaged about 30,000, which is still quite large, but small relative to the scale of the project and the available spawning habitat. The replacement was done in 2010, and again, it's not an immediate response. By 2014, it reached a peak of 271,000. So from 30,000 to 271,000. And again, the reason I put the remainder of this data, um, and apologies, I don't have it extended through last year, um, but you can see it here. We did see a decline, and it, it wasn't really likely something within this system, because we saw this consistent decline in many, though not all, um, herring runs around the Cape. So we had several here, you know, this is Stony Brook, this is Herring River here in Wellfleet, Tom Matthews Pond. Um, each of these seem to have kind of a high, it was a good year. So we have recovery from this as well as external um, benefits. Many of these declined 2015, 2014, 2015 time frame. But in Herring River, it, it started to recover again. So whatever that external influence is, we're starting to already see recovery. It's back at about 131,000 estimate. Um, last year. So just to caution, it's important to look at the data for your system, but kind of look at it in the larger context as well to really understand what's going on. Um, this project also won an award from the NOAA Coastal uh, America Award in 2011 um, due to its success, and it has a lot of those same partners. As Martha mentioned, there's a lot of um, inherent knowledge through the people involved in this from NOAA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, um, the state, um, actual individuals, APCC has been involved in many of these NRCS. So a lot of what we learned from one project, what's been learned from Muddy Creek will be applied to Parker's River, what was learned from Stony Brook was applied to those projects. And the last project that I want to talk about is Suet Creek in Dennis. Again, this is on the north side. So we have water flowing from Cape Cod, um, Cape Cod Bay, down through this uh, uh, Marina here, the river goes through here underneath Bridge Street um, and into this upper marsh, which is about 50, 60 acres. Um, it was a two foot culvert um, that was replaced in 2008 by these two 10 by 12 foot box culverts. So, again, much smaller scale than Herring Rivers, but still a pretty significant change. Um, this system, unlike the last two, was very dominated by Phragmites. Um, probably a combination of the, the very limited salinity that was getting up there and the extent of that extraction and length of time that it was restricted. So after restoration, again, same types of things that we've been talking about, the increased tidal flow, getting more salinity upstream, um, improvement to fish passage through there, though as you go further up, um, the stream crosses back under through several culverts um, before it gets to a pond habitat, so there's still more that's underway and planning to address that. Um, these, this whole area upstream was dominated before, this is a photo from last year, um, was dominated by Phragmites and other upland species. Um, the expectation is the salinity is going to kill that off, and that is what happened. We had um, 
successfully killed off most of that fragment because it's still fringing on the edges where you don't get as high salt. This kind of dead material here is more of those upland species we see that remnant. Um, but overall, we see kind of a slower recovery and filling in of the native vegetation than what we've seen at other sites. Um, this area here is kind of what we call a mud flat. That's natural to a salt marsh, but we would have expected um, over that 10 year period to see more of this having filled in with native vegetation. So APCC was involved in the monitoring from 2008 through 2011. Again, it takes time. We don't want to rush in immediately if there's not a significant issue. Um, but subsequent to that, as we saw that it wasn't really filling in, um, APCC with funding from the state um, partnered with the University of New Hampshire and went out and did additional monitoring. Again, looking at the vegetation, any changes we could see there. Um, and then trying to determine what might we could maybe do kind of adaptive management to improve the recovery rate uh, of this salt marsh. So this is um, feldspar, which is a ground up kind of shellfish material um, that was put out in small plots so we could track over time if sediment is moving into or um, leaving the system. And then we also, this is a GPS that's used for elevation surveys. Um, we also did pore water samples to look at salinity. Largely what we found is that the soil conditions um, were conducive to salt marsh growth. So we had the right kind of chemistry within the soil for plants to be growing in these bare areas. Um, what seems to be potentially um, the issue is these bare areas are lower elevation than what you would expect for middle marsh plants to thrive. So marshes are very particularly, the types of plants you see is dependent very closely on the elevation and the salinity that they get. Um, these areas were um, much closer in elevation to um, the creek edge elevation, which is where we have low marsh with um, spartina alternate flora. So um, what we have determined to do is to plant um, in some of these areas, do a pilot planting with that alternate flora, which we know grows well at that elevation. It produces a lot of biomass very quickly. Um, and we did see with some of these um, markers after one year that in planted areas that have alternate flora, um, we are getting accretion. So we're getting sediment depositing and the marsh slowly growing up. So again, another good reason to do that planting, we can help hold the sediment in place and hopefully increase the rate of plant growth in those areas. So <laughs> this has kind of been an ongoing process. We continue to monitor this site. Um, last year is when we actually went out and did the planting based on that that further research. So again, we're doing it in small areas. It's a pilot planting, these one meter square quadrats, which we space every 10 meters, um, with the understanding that alternate flora tends to grow up to kind of two to three meters a year. So we space them 10 meters with the intention of um, monitoring after our planting for two to three years. So hoping that over that two to three year period, what we plant in this um, quadrat and this one will slowly kind of grow together to fill some of those bare areas. Um, the plants, we get in plugs kind of like you get um, from a uh, nursery for any other plant. They're small little plugs. Um, they're ideally planted kind of 12 to 18 inches apart. Um, we also put in the first year, this last year for the summer, um, these markers around them with string to deter any geese from going in and trampling or eating all of our plants while they're getting established in the, with their roots in the soil. So it's a relatively small um, product in terms of amount of planting, um, but we hope for a big impact. So we set up 10 of these transects, um, nine plants in each, a total of about 320 plants. And we did some control where we didn't plant just to see if we are getting any natural seeding of plants improvement. So year one results, so then we did the planting last June. Um, ideally, we want to do planting in May, though June is still okay. Um, the reason for the slight delay is this marsh in particular, um, most of that land up until the creek edge is privately owned. So we had to go around um, and get approval from all the owners and then review it with the town's conservation commission. Um, and all were very supportive of this project. Um, one thing you should expect if you are doing planting is initial stress. We may have experienced a little bit more because we planted in June rather than earlier in the season. Um, but in July, you can see that here in this picture, these plants look rather yellow. <laughs> Um, Poosley, but by end of July, they were much more green. We saw a lot more new stem growth. So when we looked at the overall change in the plants from June when we planted to kind of end of the growing season in late August, overall there was a decrease in plant height and 
kind of a decrease in the percent cover of those plants where we planted them. And that's, that's pretty consistent with the fact of that initial stress that we saw where the plants partially died off and then we had a lot of regrowth. Um, overall though, we had 98% survival of those 300 plus plants. Only five dead, and actually some that were already reproductive within year one. So we're very optimistic. We out again this August to do monitoring and again in subsequent years. So we're hoping that this information will be really useful for the Herring River in particular, um, for areas that are expected to potentially need this sort of effort. Um, likewise, again, we saw overall an increase in stem counts. And the plants are smaller, but they're really growing a lot more, suggesting they are getting well established. We also wanted to look to see if there are other factors within the marsh that might be impairing that, that growth overall. So we looked at the density of the soil. Walking around this marsh is not easy. Um, Steve's been out there with us as well, so he knows. Um, some areas, it's very loose soil in those bare patches. You easily sink into your shin or maybe knee. Other areas, it's much more dense. Particularly, you can almost tell where the phragmites used to be because there's a lot of um, remnant root system and stem system. In others, it's very hard. So we were trying to figure out if that might be influencing um, the slow response of plants. So we looked at the density, and this work um, was really done in partnership with NRCS. This is Maggie Payne, their soil scientist, who helped collect all the samples and processed all of them. Um, so we looked in the bare patches near where we did all of our plantings, as well as at the creek edge, and then creek, mid-marsh, and up-marsh, where Spartina alternate floor was already growing. So looking at comparing the places where we planted that plant and where it's already growing. Generally, what we found is there was not really significant difference um, in some cases, you know, the minimum density was about the same across the board. Some of the areas of the bare patches were higher, so we had a slightly higher average density, um, which is pretty consistent with other sites that had been restored. But there was really no correlation that we could find between soil density and plant growth, both where there is existing plants and where we are planting. So we don't really think that that is the reason that we're seeing slow recovery of the plant. We did go back and do additional elevation surveys as well. We wanted the exact elevations of where we planted so we can um, look at that over time. Um, so again, this work was done with NRCS. So again, we got um, sampling of the elevation of the soil surface where we planted in those bare patches, um, as well as near the creek, near the middle part of the marsh and the upland in that restored area where there is spartina alternate floor growing. So what we essentially found is that the areas we're planting Consistently, um, we're kind of close to or in between the elevation near the creek and mid marsh areas where Spartina was growing. So, again, um, supportive of the fact that this is a plant, um, the right area that these plants should thrive. Again, elevation is a big determinant of what plants will grow there. The other um, promising information that we saw is as you go from the creek edge towards the upland away from the creek, you see an overall increase in elevation which is what you expect to see in a marsh. It's low under <coughs> the creek and it slowly increases as you move away. So again, um, that's conducive to having, over time, that proper um, transition from low marsh near the creek to um, high marsh middle and kind of those more freshwater species near the upland. So I think we're very optimistic. In the meantime, these large mud flats, while not full of plants, um, are very productive in terms of habitat for animals. Um, all these little specks you see here was my attempt to get a photo of the number of fiddler crabs that you see there when we're out there doing monitoring. Hundreds if not thousands kind of escaping you as you're 10, 20 feet away because so they can feel your vibrations as you're coming. Um, and these are all photos just taken from last year and the couple days we were out both during planting and monitoring. Large amounts of birds that use that are feeding on fiddler crabs and other organisms and fish in the water. So it's not a dead system by any means, um, but we do hope to kind of reduce the mud flat area and increase the vegetation. Um, the other piece to it, um, we hadn't done in the past um, actual transects and formal monitoring further upstream. This is the river. The bridge is kind of down this way. Um, this is Route 6A up here where it crosses again. Um, we did do some additional kind of uh, survey work there last year though. And these areas, again, were also previously dominated by Phragmites and upland plants, which you can see kind of the remnants of here. On this site, um, 
due to the size and scale and also some existing kind of berm areas here. Um, there was no effort made to remove that um, freshwater plants before. But again, you can see that did die off um, as a result of increasing salinity. In this area that otherwise used to be filled in with Phragmites, all of this that you see here now is Spartine Altern Flora. And a lot of it was essentially chest high. So while near the bridge, we're seeing kind of larger bear patches further upstream um, where that we had a similar kind of dominance of upland and Phragmites, we are seeing the native plants um, coming back in, which is also very positive. Um, so over time, I think we're really learning from this project and we can use that information for others. But just to highlight something Martha said in the beginning, there's been a lot of projects done on the Cape, um, a dozen or so completed from 2002 up through 2016 with Muddy Creek, which Bob spoke about. Um, others underway, including Parker's River, Herring River, Mayo Creek, and Eagle Neck Creek. And uh, again, a lot of the knowledge and partners involved in each of these um, continue throughout to the projects that are ongoing today. Thanks. Thanks, April. Um, so we have about 25 minutes or so um, to stay in the room. Um, if folks have questions, um, if you guys want to get some chairs, just stand. Um, <coughs> I have a question. And it, it concerns the, um, the Harwich Chatham project, which you had described as a wastewater project um, following the, uh, the, in the time frame of the Estuarts project. And I imagine that uh, you, you're one of the many towns who brought water feeds into estuaries that are under a court mandate to, to either sewer or uh, drop down the nitrogen level. But I, that's why I, I'm asking because locally the cases that I am. But I, it wasn't clear to me what exactly what benefits you expected in by way of wastewater improvement. And I'm wondering if, if you could talk a little bit about that. And I, I wanted, before you do, I just wanted to say that this is a subject that I'm not really familiar with, but, I, but I've been in a few meetings recently with, where it's been discussed, and I'm appreciating for the first time that if nitrogen is not reduced in our harbor, then we're going to have to put in a many, many, many million dollar septic system. And that's going to affect my taxes. So I take a new interest in this. <laughs> that usually gets people's attention when we start talking about it. Um, yeah, two things. First, well, a couple things. First of all, salt marshes are exceedingly good at taking out nitrogen. So that alone is a good reason for restoring a lot of these systems. The reason, frankly, the reason why most of the salt marshes that are still here look so good is because we're feeding them nitrogen. All right, they're very good at taking up nitrogen. Um, we started looking at Muddy Creek in the early 2000s as part of our comprehensive wastewater management plan. We finished that plan before we finished the Muddy Creek project. Um, Chatham made the decision to sewer the entire community, okay, and, and that's the, the route we're heading down today. Um, it's a 30-year plan, we're about eight years into it. Um, Harwich, however, was in the process of doing their wastewater plan when the Muddy Creek project came along. They have actually, are, are potentially going to be scaling back some of the wastewater components of their project because they're getting improvements in the watersheds because of the change in Muddy Creek, right? By take, dealing with that nitrogen that's been sitting in the creek all these years and now to be mitigated. However, we did not propose this as a nitrogen mitigation project, all right? Even though we knew there were gonna be water quality benefits there's no funding for water quality benefits. There is funding for marsh restoration projects. So when we were, when we were doing all this, and Carol Ridley was, was integral to this, and she, she remembers, I, used to, I first started touting it as a water quality restoration project. 
And I quickly had to learn to change that to a wetland restoration project because Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA and these agencies that have all this money are not funding water quality projects. They are funding wetland restoration projects. So a lot of it becomes semantics, but it's how you propose it to the various agencies that are holding the checkbooks. Uh, so yes, Harwich, we're not, on the chapter side, we were, we were really doing it for ecological reasons. Not to say, all right, if we do this, we can scale back on our wastewater side. Uh, because we made the decision to sewer the whole town for other reasons besides purely ecological. <coughs> Harwich is looking at it and potentially is cutting back on some of their wastewater needs. I understand that Lovely is considering alternative, an alternative plan which has temporary approval. approval. I can't speak to it specifically, but I'm really out of my, my, my brain yeah. or my comfort zone. Um, but uh, I was interested to, in, when you got to your new, the chart that showed the nutrient reduction and the nitrogen yep. levels approaching that those that were in the salt water, in the water, salt water bodies. Right. So, um, thank you. Yeah, all these projects, you know, that's the one good thing, well, not the one good thing, but one of the best things about these projects, they have a multitude of benefits. There's very rarely a downside, uh, but, you know, they improve water quality, they improve ecologic, ecological conditions, they improve shellfish, they improve fin fish, you know, all those things. Usually the only downside um, maybe impacts the private property, you know, from say flooding, but that can be mitigated. I haven't seen one of these projects yet where that negative kind of component can't be addressed and dealt with. And when you look at that versus all the long-term benefits to ecology and aesthetics and everything else, they outweigh the, the negatives. You know, they really do. Uh, Bob, I had a question. When you say uh, we, when you're talking about the, the project, the, the construction of the project, who's who's we? I mean, in the, in the town, is it your department? Or is it, who's who's involved actually? Actual implementation. Uh, well, the we is the big we. I mean, it takes the staff with the technical knowledge. It takes the consultants. It takes the contractor. But it also takes the board of select and the finance committee, because these all take money. You know, I had to go to town meeting with after the selectmen and the finance committee and said, yeah, it's good. They recommended approval of town meeting. But I had to go to town meeting and convince the voters to pony up, you know, our share of the project. And just like the ones that, that you know April showed, we had funding from five or six different sources as well. You know, that's the only way you can afford to do these things. Towns can't afford to do it on their own. So, you know, it's really everybody has to be part of the team. You know, obviously some people may be more involved than others, but, you know, to get these things done, you know, as I said, 17 different permitting agencies. And I'll say too, for the Parker's River project that's ongoing now on Yarmouth, which I've been involved with the planning through kind of permit ready design and permitting, in terms of town staff, it's, you know, town planning office, it's the conservation commission, the conservation administrators there at those meetings, um, DPW, as well as natural resources. So it really does split in several departments. And each person is focusing on a different aspect of that, but it's really been a joint effort, particularly for that project, across many departments in the town. I'd like to challenge the statement that there are no downsides to these projects, which I think you just stated. Is, is that correct? Yes. So let's take Sesuit Harbor. Um, that, according to reports in the press, has created a challenge to the boating industry, to the commercial fishing industry. Um, there are parts of that area that are now not accessible by boat, heavy draft boats. Um, th there is suggestion that there might need to be a $20 million dredging project arising from that. 
So that would be one example with severe economic consequences as well as challenges to uh, the recreational aspects of uh, the area. Let's take Hatches Harbor in Prov Provincetown. Um, that was also a restoration project and it led to an explosion of mosquitoes that had to be mitigated. Now they were mitigated, but that was a downside that had to be dealt with. We heard a lot of, of process uh, in your, both of your presentations, uh, and we heard a lot of intermediate outcomes. We heard about changes in salinity. We heard about changes in the range of dissolved oxygen. I don't think these are things that the average citizen really is concerned about. We didn't hear anything about red-tailed hawks or box turtles. We heard nothing at all about the ecology and the effects of flooding areas that heretofore had not been flooded. So I think that there's been a rosy picture presented today. I think that if people delve into the details, they'll find that there are downsides we haven't heard anything about, about green flies, um, yet we know that those are saltwater species and they will not be a, pro a problem in areas that have been converted from saltwater to freshwater. But your proposals are all the opposite direction, to convert from freshwater to saltwater. We heard nothing about green flies. We heard nothing about mosquitoes. We heard nothing about the ecology of the mammals and, and, and birds and crustaceans that are going to be impacted by this sort of flooding. So I think there are some other, other issues that have not been raised today. Okay, uh, you're absolutely right in, in some respects. You know, we, we, we were given a half an hour. <laughs> you know, we, we can talk about these things for a day. Um, those are all valid points. However, in, in the case, and I'll use Muddy Creek for an example, we're not creating something new. We're restoring what existed prior to the embankment going in at the turn of the century. All right, we're not, we're not creating a new wetland out of a, an upland area. We're simply restoring something, and that's most of what these projects are doing. You know, as I said, a lot of the embankments and all and, and restricted culverts that we're dealing with went in back in the 1800s and the 1900s involved with the railroad when it came to Cape Cod. That's when a lot of these restrictions came about. Or they came about when we built Route 28 or Route 6. So in many cases, we're simply putting nature back to the way it was before, frankly, we entered our, interjected ourselves into the picture. All right? We have seen... For Muddy Creek, it's not something we've been actively monitoring, but I can tell you that neighbors to the creek don't hesitate one bit to call me up or send me an email and say, hey, I've seen more hawks, I'm seeing bass fish, I'm seeing otters, I'm seeing all kinds of wildlife in the last, we finished the project in the spring of 2016. Since that time, I've gotten myriad calls from the neighbors saying, we're seeing things that we haven't seen in 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. So those other components of the ecology are in fact being improved. All right, we may not be absolutely out there, you know, monitoring every little one, but we know overall, if you benefit the ecology, all those other things will fall into place. Uh, mosquitoes is, is unquestionably an issue, all right, however, there's ways to deal with it. I mean, you know, let's face it. The only reason mosquitoes are an issue is because we don't like them. They are part of the ecology. And you go to any coastal area, you know, that's got salt marsh, there will be mosquitoes. But we can manage that. You know, I'm, I'm not advocating that we restore these salt marshes and then what we do in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and that is go in and ditch them all in quadrants to drain them to get rid of the mosquitoes. There are other ways to deal with the mosquito population. Same thing with the greenhead flies. We live in a coastal environment. There are going to be greenhead flies. I've lived on the coast my entire life. When I grew up in New Jersey, I spent my summers on the Jersey Shore. We had greenhead flies. 
you, you learn to deal with it. You didn't go out at dusk because that's when they're out. The rest of the day was fine. So either, you know, either we can kill them all or we just change our behavior to deal with it. Yeah, so two comments. One about Sasuit Creek. Um, we know and are aware there is an issue within the harbor that people have seen um, in, in kind of increasing of sedimentation there. That being said, the harbor and the marina, when it was built, I don't know the date, is in the marsh. That upper region you can see is in the marsh. So we've already put a kind of built structure in a natural system, which naturally is going to, um, even in that downstream area, have sedimentation loss at the marsh edge. So that's probably part of it. Long, long term, we haven't studied sediment movement. Nobody that I'm aware of has studied the sediment movement in that system. So there's really no data to show where that sediment's coming from. So conclusions to say that it's the restoration that did it, um, there's really no basis to make those conclusions. Nobody studied the, the sediment movement within that system. That being said, in terms of the point about um, birds and other animals, that has been studied again. I didn't cover it with these, but that is something that was part of monitoring all of those um, earlier projects, in particular um, bird surveys as well as nectin surveys. One thing that we found over time um, is that the data that is most consistent with these large scale, particularly when it was more volunteer um, supplemented monitoring work, is that we're able to um, get more reliable data from the vegetation and the salinity. So it's not to say that we're not getting useful information from those surveys, but birds and animals move, and for a limited period of time that you can do those surveys, you're not getting a full scope. So in terms of limited capacity for monitoring, <coughs> you can see the change, but it's not as quantifiable. Um, so that being said, um, APCC along with DER, um, one of the major funders of this, as well as the Conservation District, we are planning to go back and we have all the information from those reports and we're kind of working now over the next couple of years, hopefully, to create a comprehensive summary of those past projects, which will include information about all of those, which I think will help benefit people understand kind of the change that you get from these restoration projects. So that has been studied, um, the birds and, and nectar at many locations. Um, but yeah, I didn't present, I didn't present on that here. Just a broad, broad point, just one you know, 30 second point, and that is you say that we, we, we are restoring a, a situation that was in existence decades or, or centuries before, but in fact you you both admitted that you haven't gotten there, that you're in an interim phase where you've destroyed, in many instances, the saltwater, um, I'm sorry, the freshwater vegetation, but the, but the saltwater vegetation hasn't taken over yet. You suggested that 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 you're waiting, and the young lady has suggested that they're actually out there trying to plant mm -hmm. what had been destroyed. And it's a fool's errand to try to do something that nature hasn't done. So uh, Th these rivers flowed for over 6,000 years, my friend. That's how long it took for this ecosystem to, to, to develop. Absolutely. And there were fish that are, were seeking these rivers for that amount of time. And we came in and just destroyed the whole thing. So obviously it's going to take some time for it's it to gonna take, turn around. It, it'll probably take a century to get back to where it was a century ago when the humans intervened. It, and that's it, all 15 I'm years so, in so the patient. term of 6,000. Think of that. Based on what we're seeing and what others have seen around the country and around the world, it will not take centuries. Uh, decades potentially, but the amount of you know the amount of resiliency of Mother Nature that we see in these systems is amazing. I mean, I've worked on wetland projects around the country, and, and you know, down south to get at one of the things April was talking about. You know, elevation is critical in a lot of these circumstances. An inch can make a huge difference. And so down south, what they do is to help Mother Nature along. Sometimes they will go in and put a, a, an inch of dredge material on some of these wetland areas, and shortly thereafter, the plants are right back in there because it finally hit that sweet spot. And you know, over the last 10, 15, 20 years, that's what we've learned. So now these things are done much better, much more quickly, and with less impact than they were 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. But that's, you know, I hate to say it, that's science. I mean, I'm a scientist. That's what we learn over time, and we get better at it. 
The other oh. thing I'd say is it does, <clears throat> sorry, it does take time. So suet is kind of a exception to the rule in terms of the vegetation regrowth. Most of that immediate response you'll see in the first few years of the die off and start of to regrowth. The example from Stony Brook, which was done in 2010, um, which again was only a partial restoration. There's another culvert that could have been replaced that was not, to, again, to restrict the amount of flooding upstream. You know, we're not seeing large bear patches where that the fragment use was there. That that refilled and is successfully filled in with vegetation. So the, ex the expectation is not necessarily it's going to take multiple years, but again, it depends on the unique site and the scale. So overall, with each of these products, we know the general trends that we're going to be seeing, but you plan for what that site is for the existing conditions that you have. And the Herring River Project, there's a lot of research that's been done there. There's plans to address the large areas of upland, phragmites, and you know, not salt tolerant plants. There's a vegetation management plant to remove a lot of that. Um, so I think, again, the planning fits the scale of the project. And across the board, we have seen the positive response that you expect. Um, we bring in, in, in the Sisua example as a case of how you can manage for when you're not getting the response as quickly as you expect. Um, I just wanted to comment on the Sisua issue since I live a mile from that site in East Ends. Um, and this is a concern in Wellfleet also of uh, sediment export from these systems. Number one, when the project was proposed at Dennis, the officials asked for money to dredge the harbor because it was already sedimented in. That was not an allowed cost of the project. So they already had a problem. And what Rachel, uh, what April said about the uh, conditions of which it was built in are also true. Mm -hmm. Number two, simple measurements say that incoming tides flow faster than outgoing tides. Simple physics says faster water, more sediment dislodged and carried and carried further. So the, all these systems are what are called flood dominant systems. Sediment gets driven further up into the system and comes out. Number three, the, the bare areas there are much smaller than the harbor. So that's a simple size thing. And they're not eroded all the way down to the creek bed. They're just a little bit lower. So you look at these kinds of situations and you say, that's just not making sense as an explanation for the sediment in the harbor. There are much better explanations for it. And I'll just leave it at that short answer. There's more to it. OK, thanks, Steve. Um, we do need to be out of the um, room in about five minutes. So are there other questions for Bob and for April? I do have a, question, a couple of questions about Muddy Creek, but I just wanted to state that I, as, uh, I worked as a park service ecologist at the Hedges Harbor Restoration Project. And monitored, as part of that work, monitored mosquito breeding ecology, and there was no explosion of mosquitoes after that restoration. There was a shift in where mosquitoes were breeding, and there was a shift in species of mosquitoes, but there was no explosion in the mosquito nu nuisance. But I wanted to ask a couple of questions about um, when Muddy Creek was restored, when the big culvert, the big bridge was put in. Did you see improved drainage after an event where Route 28? Overwashed is it is the duration of flooding shorter now? And another question about restoration there is: Do you see the decrease in the coliform bacteria? Yes, and yes, yes. yes. It, it definitely drains out faster. So when the whole system floods, both in through the new creek as well as well as the water that's coming in from overtopping Route 28, it now has a way to get out. Very similar to what April was talking about in one of her projects. And in terms of fecal coliform levels, yes, we are we are monitoring fecal coliform levels. We have seen a decrease in those. Not as much as you know you might hope for initially. With three or four feet of organic sediment sitting there, there's a huge thing. And it's gonna take some time. And you know, that's why I want to, you know, one of the things that, that's critically important in these discussions is public education. And and not and making sure the public has realistic expectations. And that the public isn't going to say, oh, wait a minute, you opened that up six months ago. Why isn't it you know, fully restored and perfect? 
Well, you know, it's going to take time. You know, as I, as I, you know, I give talks all over the country, and I, I frequently say, look, it's taken us 350 years to screw up Cape Cod. We're not going to fix it in a year. And, and you know, just keep it with, you know, accept that and be willing to say, okay, we're making a dent in it, um, and things are getting better. You know, it's the whole wastewater side of things. You know, I've got a 30-year wastewater plan. The taxpayers are like, you know, it's going to take 30 years. Why don't you do it quicker? And I say, okay, you guys give me $250 million and let me rip up every street and town at the same time and we'll get it done quicker. But you know, that's not feasible. I can't work in the summer. You know, most winters you can't work in. So you get these narrow shoulder seasons and even then, you know, the Chamber of Commerce is complaining, wait a minute, you can't work, you can't work in September and October until after Columbus Day because that's the shoulder season. You know, in the fall, now there's a shoulder season in the spring. But, you know, I gotta rope up the road sometime to get this done. Like, you know, it drags it out. But people are hope hopefully now more educated to that, to those big times. Well, and I think, um, just to comment, overall it sounds like uh, with all these projects that monitoring is really important of the system on which there's a vast monitoring plan for the Herring River, as well as um, that incremental opening of the gates over time so there won't be that dramatic flush or extensive die off that that may be seen in, in some of those areas um mike uh i think yes yeah. last question <laughs> and money creek is an initial closure for shell fishing okay it's it was open before the money creek project started now it's closed do you know when that area will be open again for shell fishing well the upstream side of Route 28 has been prohibited for decades. Yeah, I know that. The downstream side from basically the bridge out to Pleasant Bay, that's conditional. Um, that's opened every winter. It's closed now, though. Uh, it should be. It should be open right I now. I saw your website. It's closed. Don't trust everything you read. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. It, it probably just didn't get updated, to be honest with you. Okay. Because, yeah, the area from the Route 28 bridge out to Pleasant Bay um, absolutely should be open. I think it opened December 1st. Because it mentioned every site in Chatham that was open and the only thing was closed. Yeah, like I say, don't. Go yeah, out there and see what happens. You have a question, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> you have a question, Paul. <laughs> so, and I did hear that uh, from the uh, Carwich Natural Resources Officer that the, the SPAT, the SET, and, and Muddy Creek was the best they've seen yep. in decades yep. upstream. So that sounded um, like pretty positive news for shellfish. Mm -hmm. um, so at six o'clock, thank you everybody so much for coming. Um, <laughs> They're free if anyone would like one. Um, they're, they're up here. And, um, and, and please let us know other uh, um, items of interest.